After Tom Selleck and his sexy mustache were done looking up women's in Magnum P.I., and right after Alan Rickman gets chucked out of a skyscraper by John McClane, the two battle it off in a film set in the Wild West, but down under. Released in 1990, it features a fun blend of comedy, adventure, and much more. And I think it's an absolute travesty that this film is so underrated. And given that I'm Aussie myself, I thought I'd make it my duty to craft a video. So here's my look into Quigley Down Under. You want to see what that thing does? Press the red button down at the bottom. What, this one? Oh! American cowboy Matthew Quigley, played by Tom Selleck, is one of the world's highly skilled marksmen who is hired for a secret job in Australia by the villainous Elliot Marston, played by Alan Rickman, a wealthy Australian ranch owner. Upon his arrival in Australia, Quigley befriends Cora, played by Laura San Giacomo, famously known from the classic 90s sitcom Just Shoot Me. Quigley then travels to Marston's ranch, and when he arrives, we are introduced to Marston and his goons. He's then asked for a demonstration of his skill. And very reminiscent of Martin Riggs from the scene in Lethal Weapon 1, Quigley shows off his marksmanship by shooting a bucket from a great distance. And this more than proves to Marston that Quigley is the right man for the job. Once he finally sits down with Marston to discuss the job, Marston reveals his hatred and disgust for the natives, or Aboriginal Australians. This is highly motivated by the fact that Marston's parents were brutally killed by a pack of Aboriginals. Also that they have become a nuisance, killing their sheep and cattle. Marston explains that the Aboriginals have learned to keep distance from rifle range, making it very difficult to shoot them. He implies that Quigley's skill will help him, and his evil plot to practically commit genocide. Any normal human being would have simply declined the offer, and returned peacefully back to America. Well, not this cowboy from Wyoming. He won't tolerate any of this nonsense. He won't stand for it. What the hell? No, stay right where you are. No man knocks me out of my own house. He's now trapped inside Marston's house with Marston and his goons outside plotting. Ironically, it was Marston's Aboriginal butler who knocks out Quigley, resulting in Marston and his goons to capture him. Both Quigley and Cora are dumped in the middle of the hot Australian desert to be left to die. Luckily for them, a group of Aboriginals rescue them, and the Alliance was born. For the remainder of the film, Quigley, like a cowboy Oscar Schindler, defends the Aboriginals against Marston's goons, shooting them one by one until the final showdown at the end of the film, where Quigley and Marston meet for an epic duel. Writer John Hill, known for his work on Quantum Leap and LA Law, first wrote the script for Quigley Down Under back in 1974, after reading an article in the Los Angeles Times about the horrible genocide of the Aboriginal Australians which historically took place in the 1800s. By the mid-1980s, the film was planned for a Warner Brothers release, and for Lewis Gilbert to direct. The film ended up being produced by Pathé Entertainment and distributed by MGM. Australian-born Simon Winsor landed the job as director. He later went on to direct famous films such as Free Willy and Lightning Jack. The music was by Basil Polidarus, who also composed the score for Robocop and Conan the Barbarian. I did notice this actually because being a Robocop fan myself, I felt that the music really resonated with me. For instance, have a listen to this piece of music as Quigley defends the Aboriginals. It does sound Robocop-esque with a hint of cowboy western and it helps create that element of suspense and excitement. Other acting choices to play the role of Quigley were Steve McQueen, Clint Eastwood, and Harrison Ford, 
Understandably, Ford declined due to it being too similar to his already iconic role, Indiana Jones. Funnily enough, it was Tom Selleck who was originally meant to crack the whip as Indiana Jones, but was unable to due to contractual agreements for Magnum P.I. Mmm, I don't know about that moustache. The Nazis might have mistaken him for a commie. The only choice for the villainous Marston was Alan Rickman. He was high demand for villains at the time, with the massive success of Die Hard, where he played the iconic role of Hans Gruber. He subsequently played the role of the sinister Sheriff of Nottingham in the classic 1992 Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. Rickman was apparently delighted to take the role of Marston in Quigley Down Under, and saw it as an opportunity to visit Australia. Sadly, Alan Rickman passed away in 2016, and in an Australian talk show in 2018, Selleck tributes Alan. It's a certain kinship. I think we have a lot in common. I see that. I saw it with our crew on Quigley, because we were family. The late Alan Rickman, the lovely man. Uh, I... The film features a young Ben Mendelsohn, who plays one of Marston's goons. Ben went on to do much bigger films, such as Dark Knight Rises and Steven Spielberg's Ready Player One. Given that Quigley Down Under had a budget of $18 million, and only made back $21 million, one would assume that a sequel would be out of the question, but it seems that the producers had higher hopes. Selleck hints at a possible Quigley sequel in an interview on the Arsenio Hall show in 1990. And then Alan Rickman's in it, and he was... Uh... Heavy and Die Hard. Real good actor. So, it's and good you, movie. you are Quigley. I'm Quigley. Well, not now. I used to be Quigley. <laughs> and will be again. Yeah. Uh, we have a clip. What's in this clip? It's a shame we never got that sequel. Perhaps they could have gotten Jeremy Irons to play the new villain and be Marston's brother. Get it? In terms of its rating, there's a few brutal gunfights where you see Quigley blow holes through the bad guys. There are also some pretty horrific and heart-wrenching scenes where Marston's goons attack the Aboriginals. There's no swearing or any sexual stuff, but it was still stamped with a PG-13 rating and M for mature audiences here in Australia. So it's not exactly a kid's film. The film currently holds a 60% score on Rotten Tomatoes, and the 6.9 stars out of 10 on IMDb. Well-known film critic Roger Ebert gave the film 2.5 stars out of 4, arguing that it was a flawed but respectable neo-western, and particularly praising San Giacomo's performance. Her character Cora did have an interesting backstory and character arc. In a touching scene, Cora reveals that she's from Texas. One day, when her home was attacked by Comanches, she hid in the cellar and accidentally suffocated her child to death while trying to prevent him from crying so they wouldn't be heard. When her husband came home, he was disgusted in what she had done, so he banished her by putting her on a ship to Australia. This is why, as a sort of coping mechanism, Cora constantly calls Quigley by her husband's name, Roy. This annoys the hell out of Quigley, but does provide some comedy relief. So anyway, Cora rescues a baby Aboriginal in the third act. Quigley leaves the two safely in a cave to go look for a town. Cora was then given an opportunity to redeem herself when this time a pack of dingoes arrived. And just as she's about to do it again... You cry, you want to cry, you cry, you want to. Go on, darling, cry! Hell! Let's both make some noise! Yes, we together at the river, the beautiful, beautiful river. The film did win a few awards, including a London Film Critics Circle Award. Alan Rickman took home Best British Actor for the Year. There is some decent comedy in this film. Throughout the first act, right off the bat, we get cheesy dad jokes, which will make you chuckle. Oh, get the hell out of the way! I'm so sorry, Mr. Quigley. We seem to be holding that man up. 
No, ma'am. I just spoke to him, and he ain't in that big a hurry after all. Where are you from, mate? Wyoming. Right near Sydney. A bit further north. From the beginning of the film, Cora deludes herself into believing Quigley is her husband, Roy. Roy? Oh, Roy, it's you! <laughs> Wait, I wasn't talking to you. Don't worry, Roy. Everything's gonna turn out just fine. Mm -hmm. Not Roy. But then, in that Martin Riggs scene, your man able to eat something that far away? I don't know him. I never saw him before. <laughs> this just shows how mentally unstable she is. But it's done in a very light-hearted and comical way. And in this scene, she offers herself to Quigley. But Quigley has far too much honour, and will only make love to her if she calls him by his real name. In the final scene, in a very touching and romantic moment, Cora finally refers to him as Matthew Quigley. Matthew Quigley. Let's hope she can keep this up for the wedding, and not muck it up like somebody else. In the scene where Cora tells Quigley that her husband banished her to Australia, she describes that he puts her onto the ship and never looks back. She knew that he never looked back because she watched him as the ship sailed off. This emphasises how cold he was. Later in the film, when Quigley sets off to Marston's ranch to take him out, Knowing that he may never return, he bids Cora farewell. Ah, but as he rides off, will he turn back for her? To give her a bit of a look-see? Eh? Will he? Y yes he does, he does! Ah. Now my favourite aspect of this film would have to be Alan Rickman. He will certainly go down in history as one of the greatest antagonists modern cinema has ever seen. It is a simple yet powerful testament to his portrayal of Hans Gruber. Despite the die-hard franchise staying power, with audiences and Bruce Willis's flair as hero John McClane, no sequel has ever measured up to the original film because no subsequent villain could ever match Rickman's magnetism, and his role as the sinister Sheriff of Nottingham in Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. Now, it doesn't matter if the movie is a guilty pleasure, or if you happen to agree with the vast majority of critics at the time, who maligned it. It can easily be agreed that Rickman's portrayal of Sheriff of Nottingham is definitely the highlight of the film. And same with Quigley Down Under. We are treated with the classic bad guy performance. Some men are born in the wrong century. I think I was born on the wrong continent. <laughs> Oh, by the way, you're fired. Matthew Quigley is really beginning to annoy me. Dobkin, get every available man. I'll find Ashley Pitt. Yes, sir. And get him out of here. He's bleeding all over the rug. One day, a couple of months back, I was sitting on my couch and I suddenly wondered, like any normal sane person would, which actor had the best moustache in Hollywood history? So, I googled it. And I was not surprised to find Tom Selleck was on the list. From all that search and discovery of fun, I stumbled across his movie, Quigley Down Under. It looked right up my alley, so I watched it for the first time. And I'm bloody glad I did, because it was an incredible fun adventure, comedy, and even a western. Great cast who provide great performances, a simple, but great story with even a good moral. It is beautifully shot, showing the stunning and majestic Australian outback. Powerful and just perfect sounding musical score. I definitely recommend giving it a watch if you haven't already seen it. It's a must see if you enjoy movies from the 80s and if you're a fan of westerns. 
especially if you're an Aussie like myself. The DVD or Blu-ray might be a little hard to come by, but it's certainly available on multiple streaming services, so don't muck around, get onto it. And remember, don't mess with the Aboriginals whilst Quigley's in town, or else...